consider for a moment the Second World War and some of the most destructive acts that occurred during that great calamity of history. The bombing of Warsaw, the Blitz on London, the attack on Pearl Harbor, the firebombing of Tokyo, and the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I bring this up not to remind you of the horrors of war, but to help give a sense of scale when I tell you that today, there are fleets of submarines cruising the world's oceans, each carrying more firepower than all of the weapons used throughout the entirety of World War II combined. It's a mind-boggling fact and a testament to mankind's might that such weapons of utter destructive power have been designed and built. Known as Ballistic Missile Submarines, or SSBNs, these stealthy, underwater giants patrol secretly and silently in the depths of the world's oceans in anticipation of a day that will hopefully never come. The day when nuclear war erupts. The day the world comes to an end. And yet while it can be argued that these weapons have never been used, it can equally be argued that they have been used every single hour of every day for the last six decades. Because the SNBN's true power is not their use to destroy an enemy, but the very fear they instill in one's enemy, thus preventing them from starting war in the first place. Known as nuclear deterrence, this concept of maintaining peace through the retention of such incredible firepower relies on both sides developing weapon systems that, at the very least, appear to be able to cause unimaginable damage if they were ever to be used. To that end, ballistic missile submarines have grown in power and performance to maintain their level of threat and, by doing so, maintain peace, albeit a peace bought with the potential price of global Armageddon. Early diesel electric powered missile submarines, like the Soviet Union's Project AV-611, which entered service in 1956, had just two missiles, meaning they could theoretically devastate two small cities or one large one. A modern SSBN, such as the US Ohio class, now carries 24 Trident missiles, each with up to eight independently targeted warheads, meaning a single Ohio is capable of destroying the geopolitical map of Western Europe and leaving thousands of miles of land and irradiated wasteland for millennia to come. The problem with developing such destructive potential, however, is you cannot truly test it without causing immense damage to the Earth. Even when testing missiles without nuclear warheads, only one or two were ever fired at once from a single submarine. Thus, for years, crews of the SSBNs who referred to their vessels as boomers were operating solely on the theory that if the time came, they could deploy their full nuclear arsenal safely and effectively as it had never been done in operation. As the 1980s drew on, however, and the Cold War between East and West entered its final and perhaps most dangerous phase, the Navy of the Soviet Union concocted a plan to conduct the ultimate test of their SSBNs, the launching of a full salvo of missiles. This is the story of Operation Behemoth. After the turbulent 1950s and 60s, when nuclear confrontation seemed almost inevitable, the superpowers of the US and Soviet Union, each with their own allies, entered an optimistic period in the 70s. Despite both sides still mistrusting one another, there was a deliberate effort to begin reducing the number of nuclear weapons around the world. Known as the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, or SALT, the agreements helped stop the swelling of nuclear stockpiles and banned the development of anti-ballistic missile weaponry. In the latter case, it was believed that developing weapons that could negate the effectiveness of ballistic missiles might encourage one side to start a conflict in the belief they were no longer at risk of suffering a devastating counterattack. 
By no means was the Cold War coming to an end with these improvements in relations, but it certainly represented a thawing of tensions and the promise of a better tomorrow. This promise was symbolized by the meeting of American astronauts and Soviet cosmonauts in orbit on July 17th, 1975, an almost unthinkable event just 10 years prior, and it demonstrated what could be achieved through cooperation as opposed to competition. Two events would completely shatter all the good that had been achieved between both sides in the 70s. First, in the West, the two main NATO powers, Britain and the United States, elected hardline right-wing political leaders in the form of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, respectively. Both leaders campaigned on a platform of taking a much tougher stance against the Soviet Union, which Reagan described as the evil empire, likening it to the villains from Star Wars. The second event occurred on the other side of the so-called Iron Curtain, when, on Christmas Eve 1979, Soviet troops invaded Afghanistan, sparking a wave of international condemnation. The Soviets claimed they were coming to the aid of a communist ally that was being rocked by Western-influenced uprisings, while in the West, many saw it as akin to Hitler invading Poland, and like in September 1939, World War would ultimately follow. Thus, the world entered the 1980s, wondering if they would survive the decade. Paranoia on both sides was at an all-time high, with each fearing the other was developing new super weapons with which to tip the balance in their favor. And the truth is, this is exactly what was happening. President Reagan believed that by forcing the Soviet Union to invest in new weapons to match the US, he could, in effect, bankrupt the Soviet Union into submission winning the war with dollars rather than missiles. The US therefore undertook a massive re-equipment program that saw them acquire unbelievable numbers of advanced weaponry, including nuclear weapon systems like the Rockwell B-1B Lancer strategic bomber and eventually the first Trident ballistic missile carrying submarines. The communist Soviet Union knew they were at a significant disadvantage when it came to funding their own re-equipment project to match the Americans with their seemingly limitless funds for defense. And so they danced into the jaws of the trap. They had no choice but to commit themselves to research and development of new weapons to maintain parity with the West, spending more and more. However, they had one secret weapon, the SSBN their fleet of nuclear-powered submarines. In 1968, the Soviet Navy began deploying their Project 667A class of SSBNs codenamed by NATO as the Yankee One. Armed with 16 R-27 submarine-launched ballistic missiles, each with a destructive yield of one megaton, the liquid-fueled missile had a range of 2,400 kilometers, on paper, the Yankee One and the R-27 submarine gave the Soviet Union parity with the American and British missile-armed SSBNs. However, in reality, things were a little different. The problem for the Soviets was in order to get their R-27 missiles in range of the targets in North America, they had to cross the US Navy's intricate SOSUS network of sensors between Greenland, Iceland, and the UK, the so-called Griuk Gap. SOSUS, an acronym meaning Sound Surveillance System, incorporated passive acoustic sensors that listened out for Soviet submarines who would be unaware that they'd been detected. A NATO attack submarine could then begin tailing the Soviet SSBN, ready to destroy it should the need arise. As a result, even as the Yankee One was just beginning to enter service, the Soviet Navy was already demanding a new submarine class, armed with longer-ranged missiles, which could allow them to fire their nuclear payload outside of the range of SOSUS, should the need ever arise. The result was the Project 667B Marina class, known to NATO as Delta One. The overall dimensions of the new submarine were only marginally larger than the earlier vessel, being 456 feet long and displacing 7,800 tons on the surface compared to the original Yangtze's 7,700 tons and 433 feet. However, the most obvious difference was an enlarged missile compartment in a hump-like fairing behind the sail. It was here that the Delta One housed its arsenal of 12 R-29 liquid-fueled submarine-launched ballistic missiles, or SLBMs. The R-29 had almost three 
times the range of the earlier R27 at 4,784 miles, giving the Delta I a significantly larger operational scope. The original Delta I entered service in December 1972, and 17 more vessels built to this specification would follow, representing a significant threat to NATO. The Delta-class submarines comprised of a double-hulled design, with a thin, low magnetic steel outer hull wrapped around a thicker, inner pressure hull which made it more difficult to detect using acoustic or magnetic detection systems. And yet, the Navy only grew more powerful. The Soviets demanded more improvements to be made to the next four vessels of the class, most significant of which was the stretching of the hull to 155 meters in order to accommodate four more vertical launch tubes for R-29s, bringing the total up to 16. Designated as Delta II by NATO, the four vessels also featured significantly improved soundproofing to make them harder to detect with hydrophones, such as those fitted to NATO warships, and attack submarines that would be hunting them down. These sea monsters of the Russian fleet were getting quieter, and they were getting more powerful. However, both the Delta I and II still possessed the same drawback. They could not fire their full complement of missiles in a single salvo. Instead, the missiles would have to be fired in separate salvos, which was a significant problem for the crew, since after firing the first, NATO would know where the submarine was and track it down and destroy it before it could fire the next. This drawback would be addressed in the Delta III, which could, in theory, fire its full arsenal in a single salvo. This was a new level of destructive power. Billions of lives, with just one button. The Delta III also featured a new R-29 variant, designated the R-29R. This new, terrifying weapon traded the previous weapon's single large warhead and some of its fuel for more space to carry three smaller 500 kiloton warheads that could saturate a target area, creating even more damage. Further development of the R-29 missile eventually led to the R-29RM Still. This was the longest ranged version of the missile yet, able to reach a target 5,300 miles away. It also saw another increase in the number of warheads, each with a reduced yield, this time consisting of four 200 kiloton warheads. In theory, it was even possible to configure the missiles to carry 10 100 kiloton warheads, but this was not adopted operationally. In order to carry this new weapon at sea, a fourth Delta variant was produced, the Delta IV, which incorporated the Delta III's improvements, as well as the new, more capable missile. The Delta IVs and their R-29RM missiles started to become operational by the mid-1980s, with the first of class K-51 commissioned on December 28, 1984. However, little did anyone know, but the Soviet Empire that the Delta IVs were being built to defend was on the brink of collapse. The second half of the 1980s would be a turbulent time for the Soviet Union. The economic trap set by the Americans was starting to bite. Political, economic, and even technical strife rocked the world's largest nation, and the Navy was by no means immune to these troubles. While the Chernobyl nuclear power plant disaster captured the world's attention, a potentially worse scenario unfolded almost six months later, in the early hours of Friday, October 3rd, 1986, when the Yankee One-class submarine K-219 suffered an explosion in its missile compartment. Were it not for the heroic efforts of its crew who effected repairs, and five of whom perished in the incident, there was the very real threat of a thermonuclear explosion off the coast of the island of Bermuda. Unfortunately for the Soviet Admiralty, it was only the latest in a catalogue of disasters that had affected the Soviet nuclear submarine program. 
The K219 disaster couldn't have come at a worse time for the Navy. The Soviet Union was now under the lead of Gorbachev, who was restructuring its economy under the policy of perestroika. And with relations with the West warming once again, the Soviet military feared dramatic funding cuts. With questions over their effectiveness and reliability, the Soviet submarine forces especially had to demonstrate that they were worth the colossal investment of funds by Moscow, and they had to do it in dramatic fashion. First, in March 1987, they carried out Operation Atrina. This involved five submarines bypassing NATO detection devices and sailing close enough to photograph the US coastline. The submarines were detected by NATO leaving their ports, but were lost sight of in the Atlantic Ocean. This shattered the belief in the West that the submarines could be caught. Instead, the reality is that the submarine could emerge from the depths like a kraken of mythology and decimate the American populace without any warning at any time. The US Navy in particular faced embarrassing questions from members of the US Congress regarding their ability to keep the country safe. The operation did much to restore morale in the Soviet fleet after the K-219 disaster. Building on this success, the Soviet Navy now wanted to demonstrate its ultimate power by breaking the record for the most number of ballistic missiles launched from a submarine in a single salvo. The highest number in previous tests was eight, fired for the Yankee 2 class K-140 in December of 1968, but the Delta 3 and 4 could theoretically fire twice that many. Now, several factors affect how many missiles can be fired in a single salvo. These include the strain placed on the hull of the submarine by high pressure launching of these enormous and powerful missiles. There's also the matter of stability. When a ballistic missile submarine prepares to launch its missiles, it stabilizes its course, speed, and depth. However, from the moment the first missile leaves the tube, the submarine's weight decreases dramatically on one side and is rocked by the force of the missile's release, thus upsetting the vessel's balance. If the Delta IV was angled as little as two degrees to one side or another, the following launch would have to be cancelled. So, to help counter this, the Delta IV pumps water around the submarine between launches to replace the lost weight, while computers adjust the trim of the hydroplanes to maintain stability as much as is possible. In short, it is complicated, but the Delta IV was the machine that had theoretically addressed all of these problems. In 1989, the Soviet Navy was getting ready to attempt this incredible feat, and the submarine chosen to carry out the task was the Delta IV Class K-84. On August 6, 1989, the submarine maintained a depth of some 50 meters from the surface and readied its test missiles for launch. The already cramped confines of the K-84 were made even tighter for the crew by the large number of senior officers who had decided to come aboard to view the exercise. According to Andrei Mikhailov, a veteran submariner serving in the Soviet Navy in the late 80s, amongst the crew of the K-84, there were as many as 50 officers of various ranks on board, all wanting to have their names associated with the record-breaking test. This raised stress levels to an all-time high amongst the crew, who felt they were being scrutinized and criticized over every tiny detail. Once in position, the submarine was cleared to begin its record-breaking attempt. The first missile left its tube without incident, as did the following four. However, when the sixth missile attempted to launch, a serious malfunction occurred. A leak of fuel and oxidizer from the missile caused a fire, and a pressure boost inside the silo combined to destroy the missile in its launch tube. As a result, the remaining launches were cancelled, and the K-140's record remained unchallenged. However, the Soviet Navy were not deterred, and exactly two years later, on August 6, 1991, they were ready to try again, this time with submarine K-407, under the command of Captain Sergei Yegorov. Captain Yegorov had spent the months leading up to August training his crew hard, to the point where they could almost carry out every aspect of the launch automatically. Also, only one senior officer was allowed on board for the test, Rear 
Admiral Leonid Salnikov. At 21.09 hours on August 6th, 1991, Operation Behemoth 2 began. One by one, at 14 second intervals, the unarmed R-29RM missiles began to be spat out of their launch tubes. Upon breaking the surface, they ignited their powerful liquid fuel rocket motors, which bathed the submarine in brilliant light for several seconds each time. Within 244 seconds of the first launch, the last missile had been successfully ejected. Operation Behemoth 2 was a success and Captain Yegorov and his crew had set a record that still stands to this very day. However, it was a hollow victory. In the glory days of the Soviet Union, such a successful operation would likely have seen countless honours bestowed upon Captain Yegorov and his crew. However, in 1991, the Soviet Union was teetering on the brink of complete collapse. Rocked by revolution, economic hardship and political instability, Operation Behemoth II went almost completely unnoticed outside of military circles. Barely two weeks after the test was completed, communist hardliners attempted a coup against Gorbachev whose reforms were seen by them as being the cause of the Soviet Union's woes. The coup failed. Over the coming months, more and more of the Soviet Union would break off and become independent nations until, on Christmas Day 1991, Gorbachev declared his role as leader of the Soviet Union extinct. He therefore handed over authority for the Soviet nuclear deterrence to Boris Yeltsin, who was now sworn in as the first president of the Russian Federation. The Cold War was truly over, and as such, weapon tests like Operation Behemoth were now of a dead era. Thus, Operation Behemoth's true legacy was to serve as a bookend to the Cold War, reminding us of a time when the world was so gripped by fear and paranoia that humanity literally manufactured the tool for her own destruction. As of July 2020, K-407's record remains intact. However, in the last decade, Russia has once again begun rising to challenge the Western powers militarily. The Cold War mentality of demonstrating that Moscow can match the US in combat technology appears to be returning even if most experts agree that the bulk of the Russian military is equipped with upgraded but still aging equipment. Both K-84 and K-407 remain in active service and have been since armed with still more advanced ballistic missiles. Against this backdrop of what some analysts refer to as Cold War II, it has been suspected that recent Russian missile tests are all building up to an attempt to repeat, or even better, the results of Operation Behemoth II, proving to the West that Russia remains a relevant nuclear superpower. It seems that the age of Operation Behemoth may be rising once more. <laughs>